Welcome back to the next installment of Weight Bearing Pillars, aka Osteons. This is pretty much where I left off. I believe I had done a lot of scribbling to kind of show you how in compact bone we have these columns that can really handle a lot of weight and a lot of force. I had also mentioned that there are a couple of different types of bone as far as the bone tissue goes, the osseous tissue. We have compact and we have spongy. And that's, it's a weight issue. How much weight do you want the bone to have? If it can still be very, very, very strong, yet light, that's fantastic. So let me, let me look a little bit more at this world of these osteons. Um, I'm gonna do two things. First, I wanna look at what this is all about. We see lines and dots and things through here and, and concentric lines and show you how it can be incredibly strong. And then I wanna look at what you may have seen before all of this hit or may not have if you looked at some of the compact bone slides. I wanna pull one of these out and take a look at the structure here. Now each one of these, you can see these concentric rings, each one that comes around is called a lamella. And these lamellas are going to be produced by our individual cells that are in these dark areas right here. Essentially what's happened is each one of these cells has been uh, not literally imprisoned, but it's been blocked in into this solid extracellular matrix cell called, let me see if it's on here, there we are, lacuna. So if you happen to be an osteoblast or an osteocyte in one of these, uh, you're, you're stuck. You're not like, like blood where you can meander and flow from one area to the next. It's not a liquid extracellular matrix. It's really, really solid. So you think, well, how do they get nutrients? How do they, how do they communicate? Because they still have to. I'll get around to that in just a minute. Right here, this is actually an opening. There are veins, venules, arterioles, nerves that are running through here. And with this cut, it, it, it looks like it's solid. This is actually an opening in the very, very middle. It's called, depending on the text, a central canal or a perversion canal. And so think about coming out at us. We've got all of the circulatory system and we've got our nervous system that's carrying everything to the inside of these bones. We tend to look at a bone and think, oh, well, it's just dead tissue. And it's very, very much alive. It's not dead at all. Now, let me go to an extension of this. Let me see if I can go back one. If you take a look right across here, and here's our, here are our arterioles, our venules, our nerves that are running through these. And you can see that we can go from one to the next. You're not locked completely within one of these osteons. These are called and we don't see it in this. Volkmans, V-O-L-K, M-A-N-N, Volksmann's canals, or uh, perforating canals that will literally perforate, this doesn't, ah, here we go perforation from one osteon to the next osteon, the adjacent. But that still doesn't really address the, the question of how do these, how do these cells that are locked into each one of these lacunas actually get nutrients? So let me go forward and let me explain that. If you look on each lacuna, there are these little lines that are coming out 
The lacuna essentially isn't purely one little tiny locked in cell like this. If I'm trying to turn something like this into this. But there are little extensions that are coming out. And they are called canaliculi or canaliculi, which we have the spelling right over here, C-A-N-A-L-I-C-U-L-I. Like I mentioned, either one's an acceptable pronunciation. Canaliculi or canaliculi. So I'll put one out to here. And if I do another one up here, I'm trying to hurry. The canaliculi, oops, or canaliculi of one lacuna will be, I want to get rid of that and get rid of that, in direct connection with the next. So this cell, this osteocyte, will have its membrane extended up. The one from the top will have the membrane extended down. And what they can do is now pass nutrients. And look at how extensive this network is. Each one of these lamella is just loaded. And so even though a few minutes ago I kind of said, oh yeah, they're, they're kind of imprisoned. They're not imprisoned per se, because look at them up here. These stand really well. They're able to talk. They're able to communicate. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, give me an email. Now let me take a look at just one osteon. The osteons have essentially, let's see what ones I want to make a uh, mention of. It's primarily made up of an inorganic hydroxyapatite. This is really heavy in calcium, which I don't think is a surprise when we're talking about osseous tissue. But 85% of the extracellular matrix is hydroxyapatite. Calcium, as well as um, phosphate, is in there to make it really, really tough, really, really hard. But there's also something else that's at play, and it's called collagen. Maybe you thought when I started talking fibers that, okay, we'll never see these again. Yeah, you're gonna see them a lot. Here's the analogy that I wanna make, and I'm gonna try and make it really, really fast. If you had a big slab of concrete, and maybe it was, I don't know, four inches thick, anybody who's ever done concrete work will know the answer to this. And maybe it's about uh, six meters long and two meters wide and you propped up each side and then you tried to, to put weight in the middle, what would happen is it would crack, it's brittle. This is what, well, I'll get around to that in a minute. Collagen is the equivalent of what we use to make it strong and not just purely brittle. In concrete work, we use rebar, and so it's chunks of metal that are, have a little bit of flex to them. If you've ever gone down the expressway and you've looked on the other side where they're doing work and they got all the concrete torn up, they're putting just these massive networks of metal wires down. The mesh, that's the collagen. This is about the other 15% of what makes up the extracellular matrix. Now the collagen gives this incredible strength. If you've ever driven across an overpass, one of the reasons that they can be so strong is that there is collagen that happens to be in there. So when we order, or when we kind of organize the rebar and the concrete in the form of collagen and hydroxyapatite, we get a really, really, really strong 
tissue. Now, kind of a, a cool thing is the way these cells are going to orient the collagen, they're going to have differing lines of stress and shear. They're gonna go like this, so we don't just have strength in one plane, but a whole bunch of planes as we work our way up through here. This is why if you were to go out and buy a, a dead chicken from Meyer, rip its leg off, and just have the bone and hit it really hard on the table, you wouldn't break the bone. The collagen is still there. Now bake it at 400 degrees for an hour and 20 minutes, and what you've done is destroyed the collagen, the hydroxyapatite is there. Take it, hit it with a hammer, and you can shatter that bone. Maybe some of you have, well, probably haven't done that, but you've recognized that there's a lot of difference in a bone before and after cooking and a lot of it has to do with collagen. Okay, let me, let me, let me focus. Um, there's our compact, weight-bearing pillars. And then what that will do is it gets into the medullary cavity, that opening in the middle of the bone, we transition out a smooth muscle. Not smooth muscles. Wow, I went way back in time uh, to a completely different class. We end up with spongy bone. Let me try that. Now this will still have the hydroxyapatite. It's still going to have the collagen. It's going to have the individual cells in the lacuna, still have the canaliculi. But if you look at it, it's really, really different. The morphology has changed like crazy. Each one of these extensions is what I kind of tie into the struts on the Blue Water Bridge. It allows the bridge to be relatively light, but have a lot of strength. Each one of these little struts is referred to as a trabeculae. And the trabeculae is actually built by the cells to go with the lines of stress. So if you see the lines of stress from here to here, you don't want the trabeculae going at right angles. You want the trabeculae taking the stress and the force and moving it down. So if I go back and I look at this, here are the individual trabeculae. And they're being, they're being remodeled and reorganized throughout your entire lifetime and my entire lifetime to make sure that it's really, really good at weight bearing. Yes, not, not just around the compact, not around the outside, but around or through the medullary cavity or the marrow cavity with all of this spongy bone. Now, a couple things that I want to, I want to do, I want to finish this one up first and that'll allow me to get that downloaded. But I want to take a look at, let's go back to another long bone, some anatomy of the long bone. See right here, there's this interesting plate that you find on each end. I'd like to talk a little bit about growth. Why, if you're 13 years old playing football and you break your arm, quite often you broke it at the growth plate, whatever that is. And so what is this thing? When you're old, at my age, we don't have growth plates anymore. On um, some of you that are over the age of 18, as a female or 21 and a male, um, you don't have growth plates anymore either. Sorry. So we have to talk about where did that go? Then, how do we remodel this? As you change on where you put stress, we have to remodel the bone. And then, suppose we break it, we fracture it. How does it repair? Because our doctor just helps to get this to repair correctly, but it's the tissues, it's the structures that are actually going to do the repair. So let me kill this and I'll be right back.